And that's good. Especially when he says, go to the left-hand side of the page. Yeah. <laughs> right-hand side. Oh, right I tell you to go to the right-hand side. Right -hand. That's the I'm Hebrew sorry. side. He's already started the recording. Is that what you meant to do? No, he's muted. Don't forget the AI section. Yes, I, I, I meant to do that. I assumed that you were ready to go. I, I mean, I can be ready. Okay. I have a question. What is that AI section? Like, what is that? What is that doing? What is uh, the AI and the recording? That's just yeah. so we, um, it actually takes notes for us as to what's going on. And uh, it files it away with the recording. So, oh, yeah. Uh, and look, we, we've thought about considering sending those notes to people if they wanted them or get them get them access to those notes. So if y'all are interested in the future, just let me know, Mary. Okay, y'all just send me an email to the Native Center at gmail.com and I'll get it set up. Mary, I sent you 29 pages. What is your problem? You're on mute. That's because she's cussing. That's that's the same thing that that he's sending out. No, no, it's not the same as the eight. No, no. Uh, what the, the, what I what AI does is listen to the conversation, and then breaks it into subsections of what was said, who said what, or if the teacher's saying it, it, it narrates the outline. Basically, it's it's really amazing. Yeah, I'd like it's, to see it, even though I have plenty to read. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, so I, I'll tease you guys with it, and then if you like it, tell yeah. me. Uh, let me know. Well, All you guys I, are on the on the native uh, email list, right? Okay. Yeah. I would really like the one from last night. That I really would. Since I was the direct fire for a lot of stuff, I really want to hear. That. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Are we ready to start? Yes. All right. I've got your screen ready. By the way, Ross, you're going to be able to take care of my screen for me? Just whenever you're ready. Okay. I have a secret weapon for tonight, so I want to, before I get started, happy Hanukkah. Today is the next to the last day. Tomorrow will be the last day. Today is Rosh Kadesh, the first day or the first evening, evening morning of Tibet. So we're moving into a new month. And so uh, hopefully you've lit your seventh candle tonight and tomorrow night you'll light your last one and you'll be all right with the world. Um, speaking of calendars, that's what our lesson's about is the calendar. And it's also going to be a a um, rather strange lesson. In fact, why don't I, Ross, why don't you bring up the surprise for everybody so they can see what, what I'm talking about? This will take a minute, I think. We're, I, again, I'm using the book, the Book of Jubilee, and lo and behold, here it is. Can you make it any larger for him? There you go. Now I just got to slide it over. I gave a lot of thought to trying to help you understand what I've been saying all along. This is the third week of doing this. And it is much easier to learn if you can see it and you can hear it. And so I tried to make for myself something that would help you understand time as i've said daniel's 70 weeks are not weeks as we understand them it's not five, seven days it's not 14 days each of these are jubilee weeks in other words they are 49 days and between the time that israel entered the land if you look over to the far left by the time Israel entered the land, they came at the point of 1406 BCE. And I got that from my book. So I'm starting with the correct date. 
Now, from that point, all the way to the final day, which was October 7th, 2023, you have experienced what it's amounting to 70 Jubilee weeks or 70 weeks of 49 years. That's what we've actually gone through. You haven't been here personally for the whole thing, I don't think. I think I might have been, but I'm not really sure. But I want to leave you with that idea at this point in time. Now, as you're going through, as I go through this with you, and we're going to stop and start, we're going to go across the top. You can see the orange bar, the yellow bar. That's the 70 weeks as Daniel describes them in Daniel chapter 9, verse number 26 and 27. There are 70 weeks there are seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. So that's how it is going to be laid out. Now, why don't you look or turn to Daniel, and let's go to that four, that ninth chapter, and we'll, we'll walk ourselves through this, or I will walk you through this. Now, I have plenty of notes, so I'm not going to finish tonight. My hope is that you at least become familiar with the top part of the calendar. The bottom part of the calendar that you're looking at is what I found in Daniel chapter 11. Basically, this is the information that I gleaned from that chapter. And so there were several empires that were spoken of, and I gave you time periods for each of those empires. And I gave you verses, I broke down verses. And one of the things that I might find rather interesting is as you're going through it, is that there are some verses that have almost a double meaning. In other words, it's not only speaks of a Persian king or a Roman king or a Greek king, but it can also be talking about an Ottoman or an, uh, a Muslim, whatever. But in terms of sequential, this is the best I was able to come up with. And so you'll have to be proud of me for being able to get this far. So let's go through. So 1406, Israel entered the land. Joshua led them into the land. That was the beginning of a new Jubilee cycle at that particular point. When they crossed over into the land, it was the 10th day. And as they do, they begin the process of, of a Jubilee week as we understand it. Jubilee basically is based on a 364 day calendar. Now it says it's 50 years, but we have to understand that year 49 and year 50 actually are, to, are a part of one another. They begin in the Nissan. On, in that Jubilee year actually picks up and begins at Tishri. That way the farmers can begin to teal, work their fields so that by the end of the year, by the end of Nisan the next year, that's the beginning of the next harvest. So they'll be able to harvest and continue on. Now understand this is how it works according to the Essenes. Now I use the term Essenes because they were the, tri the group that moved away from the city, many during the Hasmonean uh, dynasty, the Hasmoneans or the Maccabeans, whatever you want to call them, were not correct. They were not kosher. They assumed the power of the king, but they're not from the tribe of Judah. They assumed the power of the high priest, but they're not from the descendants of Aaron. So they really occupied a space that didn't really belong to them. And they in the beginning, everything was fine, but eventually they became more corrupt and they began to fall into line with, with traditional, as I want to say, traditional Jewish thinking. And traditional Jewish thinking says that we have to follow a lunar calendar. But all along, if you go back to the book of Jubilee, you'll find out it's also called the book of Little Genesis, because that's where it spends a lot of its time talking and identifies the lengths of time and when people were where and what was going on. I found it fascinating 
that God did not throw Adam out of the garden on the first day. There's a whole series of questionable acts that were actually going on. But anyway, that's for another lesson. The first seven weeks then are the weeks in which they begin to conquer the land and in which there is no true leader, there are only judges. And so those first seven weeks, if we go back, let's go go to this verse 26, all right? He begins by saying, well, I guess, yeah. No, let's go up to 25. Uh, Steve, give give chapter and, and verse. I'm sorry. Chapter 9, verse 25. Okay? Know and comprehend from the emergence of the word to return and to build Jerusalem until the anointed prince will be seven weeks. Now, when we see the word return, we think of coming back again, and that's correct. They're coming back from Egypt after having gone down to Egypt during the days of Jacob. So they're returning to the land 210 years later. That's when they started back. 40 more years while they were in the wilderness. They arrive back in the land and they begin the process of their first jubilee in the land. Now, at this point in time, it says they return to build Jerusalem. They don't build Jerusalem instantly. First off, they have to find the city that God was talking about. It's not until the days of David and Samuel that we actually begin to see that happen. In fact, David is that anointed prince that they're talking about here. So as we're going through it then, so after 60, well, let's see, after uh, seven weeks, the anointed one has come. And then there's 62 more weeks in which they will rebuild. Actually, the word is to build uh, streets and moats, but in troublesome times. Now, the entire time that Israel is together outside of the days of David and the days of uh, Solomon, Jerusalem was always in trouble. There was always conflict going on around them. There were lots of nations that were trying to build upon their wealth. And so these were always troublesome times as we go through it. But anyway, the streets and moats will be built in troublesome times. Then, then after 62 weeks, which is the other end of the scale, then after 62 weeks, it begins to say, and the, uh, yeah, the anointed one will be cut off and will exist no longer. Now, the word for anointed, we always understand it to be Mashiach. Well, there is two ways of looking at Mashiach. Mashiach, Melech, who is king, or Nagid, who is a prince or somebody of lesser, lesser ability. The Mashiach, Nagid, was also the word that was used to describe the high priest. He was not king but he was in charge. So therefore he was called that. So after 62 weeks, he will be cut off and we'll go through understanding how, what that really meant at this particular point in time. He literally is going to be cut off for a long period of time. So as we're going through this story, then it, it, it continues on, he's cut off and he will no longer exist. Not that he's dead, it's just the office is not going to be filled, right? The office will not be filled. And the people of the prince will come, to will come, will destroy the city. And again, the prince here is Nagid. So it's not a king. It's a lesser person. Originally, we would say this was Titus. It could also be the character called Pompey. Pompey was the first Roman to enter into the city of Jerusalem. And Pompey was there to see what he could get for himself. But I digress. Back to the story. So destruct the city and the sanctuary. We know the sanctuary will be destroyed twice. And if we're looking at this from the sense of the Romans, then this is what he's talking about, which is really what we're going to be talking about. So then, but his end will be to be swept away as in a flood. This character, this prince will be swept away. Then 
until the end of the war, desolation is decreed. The end of what war? That's the question. And he will forge a strong covenant with the great ones for one week. But for half of that septet, he will abolish sacrifices and meal offerings, and a mute abomination will be upon the soaring heights. Will extermination, as, as decreed, will pour down upon the mute abomination. Now, in Christianity, I've always been taught, and I even taught it, that the abomination was when they laid the pig on the altar, and that was the sacrifice that was made. But it says differently here. It says extermination will decree upon those who pour down on the mute. So there's something that is mute that is abominating the altar. If you look at the very center of my timeline, I highlighted a mute abomination. The mute abomination that divides the weeks in half, divides this whole 70 years in half, actually, is the building of the Dome of the Rock. It was built in 699 CE, and it sits today where the Jews believe that the temple actually sat on top of the Temple Mount. I get that from Daniel, Turn if you want to look back to Daniel chapter 12 and look at verse number 11. Daniel 12, oh. verse number, or 10, verse number 10. They will be elucidated and clarified and refined by many people. That's the Jewish people. The wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand from the time the daily offerings was removed and the mute abomination put in its place. There's 1,290 years. 1,000. 290 years. Now, if you go back in my timeline, <clears throat> we talked about David being anointed. And he was anointed in Samuel 5.5. 5. Right after that, I have a blank. Now, my map is not to scale. Okay? My map is not to scale. And it was never, first off, I'm not that good. And so what I did was I tried to separate enough so that you could actually see the individual parts. Between David, David now captures Jerusalem. Now they build the, Solomon builds the tabernacle, and we go through period of the first temple period. At the below that, I have the Babylonian Empire. And we know what the Babylonian Empire did because we read about those in the first six chapters of this book. As we're going through, we come to a point in time in which Daniel and his friends will actually be going into captivity. They will be going in when Jehoiakim rebels in 602. That's the year that he actually did the rebellion. And that goes back to Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Okay? So now we have a, a starting point. So our point of order is in chapter 11, from the time the daily offerings was removed and the mute abomination was put in its place is going to be at 1,290 years. And so if you go from Jehoiakim's removal and the destruction of the temple, 1,290 years, you end up at the year 699 CE. That's the mute abomination that they're talking about. That's the abomination. Now, to get to that abomination, there were several things that happened. On the world stage, the Babylonian Empire ended. The Persian Empire came and the Persian Empire went. The Greek Empire came and the Greek Empire ended went now daniel only goes as far as the roman empire and he does that because those are the four beasts that he talks about and as i told you way back when we did daniel chapter 7 those four beasts are mirrored by modern day nations and so what we're looking at is something else that's going to happen 
So Rome, again, remember Rome, if you did your studies in your history, you understand that the Roman Empire eventually was divided in two. There was an East Rome and a West Rome. Constantine established what he called the Eastern Rome. In fact, he even built a city and he named it after himself and they call it Constantinople. Today, that city is called Istanbul. It's the same city, new name. And the new name became because of another empire that's going to be showing up. But the Roman Empire never collapsed. The Catholic Church never disappeared or disintegrated. They just continued to morph. Now, in the process of morphing, the Roman Empire, called Constantinople, eventually became known as the Byzantine Empire. Religion began to change. And as the religion changed, so did what was going on in the city. And so a Byzantine or a unorthodox, in other words, moving away from Greek Orthodox Church, because Constantinople was a Greek Orthodox, not a Roman Catholic. And it moved and began to develop into the Byzantine Empire. Now, as it's going through that process in 613, now remember, Rome, Rome entered Israel in 280. By 613 BCE, 400 years later, we have what's called Muhammad. Muhammad begins to, well, his first move was to attempt to join the Jewish faith, and the Jewish rabbis would not accept him. So he left and he went and he tried to join with the Roman Catholics, and the Roman Catholics would not accept him. And so he went on his way and he began to develop his own ideas. Now, he said he was taught them by Allah. In 613 CE, Muhammad preached his first message. He preached it in the city of Mecca, where immediately they ran him out of town. Mecca was not going to listen to a person who was from Medina. They had a confrontation between the two. And so he was run out of town. Well, even run out of town doesn't mean he didn't take disciples with him. And he began to develop his own church, his own religion, Islam. And by 632, he had established his own religion. And by 633, he had retaken Medina. And Medina now became an Islamic city. So Medina and Mecca, both being in the same country, that became part of his empire. Now, you and I both know that, the, that Islam, or the Muslim period in time, stretched all the way across the, the North African coast, all the way up into Europe, especially into Spain, where we got what we have the, what's called the Moors that were up in Spain and Portugal. There was a lot of things going on. At the same time, during all of these periods, Jews were being sold and bought and sold and bought and sold and being spread across the entire world. They were everywhere by this point in time. And so they began to, de to de develop their own languages in as much. They kept a, a primitive base of what they, their beliefs were, but they were very, very different from one another. Now, by the second century, those Jews that had still remained in Babylon had created for themselves a Talmud, a, a written record that they would use to help him ex explain lots of different things. And, set, and help them to understand their laws as they knew them at that point in time. So 630, 632, we have a war. Now, one of the sultans who came out of Islam decided he was going to build a house of prayer for all people. Now, he decided he would build it on the site in which Muhammad, supposedly riding his black horse, jumped into heaven to speak with Allah. And so the Dome of the Rock sits on the spot, and you can see that the, the stone there is, is unperfect. It's the actual stone that would have been there. And that's where he jumped into, into heaven. 
Now he didn't stay there. He came back, and and so we have the entire period. But the the Islam began to lose its importance, and a Turkish empire began to be grown, and the Turkish empire had a caliph, and so they began to overtake. Now they didn't change much of the religious understanding, but in doing so, they split Islam. We soon had a Sunni Islam, which is the Islam of Saudi Arabia, of uh, the, those that are on the eastern side or on the western side of the map. And on the other side are the Shias or the Shiites. Now, the number one Shiite nation today is called Iran. So understand this was going on. The Ottomans were now becoming the most powerful nation, and they began to spread all the way through Hungary, Europe, all the way up into the into what we would call Eastern Europe, and all the way down into, again, Egypt, all the way through the area, down into Saudi Arabia. All of those areas all became part of the Ottoman Empire. It almost looked like the Persian Empire all over again. Now, in the process of doing this, they became, well, they went through periods of time when they were very, very active and very, very unactive and began to lose their power. Along came World War I, 1914 to 1918. 1914 to 1918 was the first war, and remember the war was over the assassination of an archduke. It was a silly war, but it created a problem because there were so many treaties and agreements between people that we ended up having a war that went well beyond what it would have ever normally been. Britain and France found themselves against, well, Germany, which is their chief rival at that point in time, and Italy, which is another rival at that point in time. And in doing so, Germany and the, their axis was kicking butt. France was losing, so was Britain. They were unable to keep up. At the same point in time, they did draft Russia. Russia became part of theirs. The Tsar joined the side of the Allies. But then they assassinated the Tsar. And we ended up with what we would call a Bolshevik, which is today modern Russian, modern Soviet Union. And they withdrew from the war. So the United States decided they would enter on the side of the Allies, but it was going to take them a year to get everything there. You and I both know that, that back then they didn't have airplane transports. They had to use ships. And so it took a long time for the Americans to finally arrive and to become part of the battlefield. Well, at the same time, the Ottomans were supplying great amounts of ammunition and, and supplies to the Axis side. And so the, the British and the French had to figure out how they were going to defeat the Ottomans. It was, I believe it was Lloyd George, who was the prime minister at that time, and the chief generals decided that they would cause a revolution inside of the, the Ottoman Empire. The Arabs would revolt, and in their revolt, that would take the Ottomans out so that they had a chance to defeat the Germans. So as it was, we get the story of Lawrence of Arabia. I think you've heard of him. So we have the stories of the Lawrence of Arabia. They managed to convince two, well, I would call, should call them Bedouins. One was, one receipt referred to himself as a Bedouin. And that was uh, the, what eventually became the king of Heshemite Transjordan, or we today call Jordan. He is a, uh, of the family of Hussein, who is now the president or the the premier of of Jordan, and a man named Il Saad, who is from the house of the Sauds or Saudi Arabia. They both agreed that they would come into the war on the side of the for an opportunity to become independent states. And so Britain guaranteed them that they could have independence. Well, by independence, that meant they wanted to have their share, which would include Israel, Syria, Saudi Arabia, 
the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, all of that area, all the way down to Egypt. That's what they thought they were bargaining for. They agreed and they immediately began to prosecute the war with Lawrence of Arabia as their leader. At the same time, while all of this is going on, the country is short on uh, gunpowder, or actually they're short on the, the material, the acetone that was used in firing the bullets. Lo and behold, Haim Wiesman, who was a scientist from Russia who was working in England, created the compound that was necessary for doing that. When they asked him, what do you want for your, your prize, money, what? He says, all I want is a homeland for the Jewish people. Well, Lord Balford, who was on the committee at that point in time, he was really an anti-Semite. He didn't like Jews at all. But he says, if this works out, we will give you Palestine. Now, at that point in time, Palestine was called Palestine, Syria. In the process of this of this whole story, one of the things that happened was you now have two agreements that you've already fostered saying you will give this to them and this to them, and who should you believe? Well, the answer was neither of the agreements were any good because you see the Brits and the French decided that they were going to divide up all of the Ottoman Empire amongst themselves. They wanted all of the glory, they wanted all the land. And so they created another agreement, an agreement between themselves. And so therefore they had agreed that this is how we're going to take care of it. And if anybody asks, we will just simply say, we, were, we are their protectors. We really don't plan to stay, even though they plan to stay because they wanted the oil. Oil was now valuable. The sods, had a great deal of oil underneath their land. So there was no way they wanted to give away to the Sauds or to the Transjordan people. In fact, they called the Transjordan people Bedouins. They were not royalty of any kind. So the war went on, the war ended. And at the end of the war, the, the white papers helped to divide up the land. Actually, France and Britain divided up the land and that's why we have all the problems in the Middle East we have today. Because you see, when they divided up the land, they did not take into consideration units or tribes. If you go to Iraq, you know you're going to run into at least three different groups in Iraq. And the same with almost all of the others. They're not of the same ethnic group. And so that's why you have a great deal of fighting. The Kurds themselves, spanned across four different nations that they created. And the Kurds have been nothing but a curse to all of them because they all want, the Kurds want their own independence in their own country. So that back in 1918, we established all that's going on today. All of this came from Britain. And Britain, remember, was the great power at that point in time. They controlled the seas. Remember that? There was no place you could go that was not a colony of the, of the Brits. Australia, India, Burma, all the way across. So as we're going through the story, we find ourselves after World War I with a new mess, with, is, with Jews who now think they have a homeland, but they don't, with Arabs who now think they've got a land, which they don't, and they began to fight among themselves. Jews began to leave Europe for the Israel. You see, they understood what was coming because by 1932, Germany had recovered somewhat and it elected a man who they simply called the paper hanger, Adolf Hitler. He began to lead the new Axis powers. He called himself a Reich. Reich is the idea of back to the Roman period in time. Reich is a king. So Adolf was going to be a king. He was going to be the third king because you see the first king happened to be Charlemagne. The second king happened to be 
um, Kaiser Wilhelm. In fact, Kaiser is the word Caesar. And so he's the third in, in the line of Germans leading to this world empire. Jews who were living there became very uncomfortable and it began to try to leave the land. And that's when we have the story of the Exodus. Remember the boats trying to get over to Israel or to, in order to, to escape what's going on. That didn't work out as well as we had hoped because the Jews or the Brits didn't want them. In fact, they sent the boats away as soon as they found them. So they did all kinds of subterviews. But that's another story altogether. If you want to find a good thing that happened in the United States in that time, you go to a senator from the state of Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Lyndon established in Houston, Texas, a port of entry for Jews leaving Europe and figured out how to get them into the country because the United States wasn't going to take them either. Now look at how many people we've taken in. Back to the story. So the six, as we reach this point, 1938, we begin to see World War I, well, actually 1937. We begin to see them going against the Poles and against the Aussies and against all of the nations around them, grabbing back territory that had German speakers in it. Eventually, it became wider and wider. And during that time, that's what I call Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. So if you go back to 12, 1, you begin to look at that text and it says, at that time, Michael will stand the great heavenly prince who stands in support of the members of your people, Israel. And there will be a time of trouble such that there had never been since there was a nation until that time. Now, we've had all kinds of problems in Israel. We've seen all kinds of devastation. But this surpassed anything. This was the worst that had ever happened. Two-thirds of the Jews in Europe will die. Two-thirds of them. Entire cities will be wiped out, villages. No more Jews. No more people, because the people were the Jews. Hungary was one of the worst countries. It saw the most deaths of, by this whole process. So in that particular case, we had a second world war that ended on our side. But I want you to look below World War I and World War II. If you look below that, you'll see that I have down there Gog I, Gog II. If you go to the book of Ezekiel, and we're not going to do it tonight, but we will do it, we're going to talk about the, the wars of Gog and Magog. I believe that there was a rabbi named Haim uh, Hofetz, Hofetz Haim, who predicted in the 1902-1903, predicted that there will be two world wars. The first one would start in about 1915. 45 years later would be a second world war. And about 75 years after that will be a third world war. Well, 1915 was pretty close because it happened that it was in 1914 to 1918. Then there was a second world war, which happened approximately the time that he predicted, 1937 to 45. And a third one that's supposedly going to happen soon, if not already. So we have our Gog and Magog stories. Now, after World War II, remember, Israel became a nation. Now, in becoming a nation, they were established in 1948. Interesting enough, the World War II fell right in the middle of the uh, Jubilee cycle, cycle number 69. You look to the right of Gog II, the Six-Day War, June 5 to June 10, 1967. After that, there will only be seven years left in the 69th year. 
lo and behold, by accident, Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur War, October 6, 1973, that's the day of Yom Kippur. That is the beginning of the new cycle of years. That is the last possible day before they begin the 70th year or this last 49 year period. So we have a particular set of dates. The final one beyond that was October 7th, 2023. That was the last day of the 49 year cycle. Lo and behold, on that very day, the years of Gentiles ended. That's what I understand. What's in its place now is all about Israel. It's not about us. It's not about nation building. It's not about anything else but about God and his people. They have reached the point, the appointed time, and now we are watching out and watching what's going to happen. From the very beginning of these 70 weeks, I told you there was a verse in scripture where it says study history. And I spent time talking to you about history should be looked at as a river. Now, if you look at a river, a river is dynamic. By that, I mean it is it is energy, and it's purposeful energy. God is moving water purposely. Time is the same way. God has moved Israel through time, just like he moves a river. All of the events that we see, all of the energy that's been expended in this whole period of time, all of that goes back to God. God has put Israel to this place at this point in time for this very war. Now, what comes out of this war, I have no idea. I know, for instance, Israel is really fighting a war against Hamas, against Hezbollah, and in Syria. They have been bombing sites in Syria trying to kill the Iranians that are there. Just this past week, the nation of Jordan began to have maneuvers. Now, maneuvers means that you're practicing for war. Jordan is a huge country. But they decided they were going to practice the war along the, the border of Israel. Now, I called it the Heshemite Kingdom of Transjordan. But I have to go back to the 67 war. In the 67 war, Israel will win back almost all the land that belonged to David. Yom Kippur will finish it. They will get the Golan Heights. And this will make Israel, Israel. But in the Six-Day War, the Jews, the Arabs, told their partners to get out of town so that they wouldn't get crushed when the Arabs came to destroy them. Oh, by the way, they tried to destroy them in, in, in June 1948. Ten nations signed a treaty. Now, could that ten nations have been the ten nations that they're talking about in Daniel chapter 7? I don't know. But when it was all said and done, there were a lot of people displaced. What do you call these people that have been displaced? Well, Britain established that they're going to be called Palestinians. Because you see, Britain didn't want Israel. Britain wanted to make sure everything remained the same. So now you have Palestinians. They're out of the city. They lose the war. Where do they end up? Two places. Gaza, Jordan. 70-some percent of Jordan 
are Palestinians. They're not Jordanians. They're Palestinians. They're marching today for their brethren. Are we going to be looking at a three-front war in the very near future? Also, I have to tell you that Algeria just signed a war agreement. They, too, will be going to war against Israel. Now, they're so far away. All they can do is supply yells and screams. But again, there begins to feel like there is this culminating effect going on. Is the energy being raised? Where are we going with that? I want to stop there tonight. And next week, I want to go through Daniel chapter 11, verse by verse, and begin to talk to you about the history of each of those verses that goes there. I guess I've only been talking for about 40, 45 minutes. So I've got plenty of time left. If you want to ask questions or you want to think out loud, sometimes my best thinking comes by thinking out loud, but it's up to you. Anybody have anything you want to talk about? Um, I know Huffett's time said that when he spoke of the three wars, he said that each one after the last would be so much worse and that the third one could be, was going to be the most horrible thing humanity has ever seen. Well, and then we, we think too. about World War II and like that was really horrible. Yeah. But, um, World War III will look like Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. If you want to get ahead of the game, you can read 12, 13, and 14. If it... Anybody? Go ahead. Go ahead, Sharon. I didn't realize that the Dome of the Rock was built in the 600s. Yes. I thought um, Britain helped them build that. Or whatever. No. Boy, was I so wrong. Anyway. No. Okay, Mary is in the queue. Okay, Mary I'm, in the queue. I'm wondering if there's a way we can get a copy of that timeline. I can sell it to you. It, it, sell it, it to me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you have a PowerPoint program? I don't know. <laughs> I build it in PowerPoint. It's a Microsoft program. So I don't hold know. Hold on, hold on. Let let me just see. I I let me see if this uh, snapshot I took of it came out. <clears throat> well, it came out good enough for government work. I'll uh, <laughs> I'll send you. Um, Did, should I send it out? Well, Steve, you have your list. You want to just send it out? If I send oh, it, doesn't to you? matter. You can. Um, um, yeah, I guess I could. If you send it to me, I will try to send it to my friends. But I don't have many friends. But I'll send it to the ones I got. Oh, yeah. Sharon's not so, one of my friends. You have Dave's so not one of my friends. Kura's not one of my friends. So uh, any, we won't send them anything. I, I have PowerPoint, so I could always print it out for Mary. Okay, if you've got PowerPoint, you can take care of all the Indiana people. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Bobby. Yep. That'll, that'll work for them. So. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll send it out. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So. Great job. Great research. Love, I love seeing the perspective of the line in history like that. I'm very impressed. That really helps me. No matter that's my good. Own, it helps me. Well, and I've been thinking about it for two weeks. And if you talk to my wife, you know that I've been frustrated for a couple of weeks and I've been working on this more than day or night, trying to make it so it makes sense to everybody. And like I said, by the time I finished, I had 29 pages of notes that I sent to some of you guys. And those 29 pages have all of the information I have, but the, the problem of it is, is the fact that you had no, you had no, nothing you could see, you couldn't tangibly hold it. So I, 
I finally fiddled out a, a kind of a roadmap so that you have that to look at. By the way, can I, does anybody else have a good question? No, not a good question, just a I question. Do. Go have ahead, Have you ever Sharon. seen this book? Yeah, I've seen it, yes. I do not have that, no. I was, I was following you, kind of. I was like, okay, let me see. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have that book. I do have an idea. If you've got time, would you turn to uh, Isaiah or to Jeremiah chapter 49? Some of these people have already heard my spiel, but I'm going to try and do it again for everybody and put it on recording. Chapter 49 deals with what they call Philistia. It's only seven verses long, but it's... Uh, It's rather interesting or powerful as to what it says. Yeah. It begins by... Nope, that's not the chapter I want. I thought it was 47. 47. Thank you, Bobby. 47. Yeah, because here's Gaza. Now, it does talk about Philistia, but it... It says the word of Hashem that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines before Pharaoh attacked Gaza. In verse 2, it begins by saying, Thus said Hashem, Behold, waters are rising from the north and will become come to a swift stream. Again, this idea of energy flowing. They will sweep away the land and all that is in it, the city and all that dwell in it. The people will cry, out and the inhabitants of the land will dwell, will wail. And because of the sound of the galloping hooves of his mighty steeds, because of the noise of his chariots and the tumult of his wheels, father, fathers will not attend to their children because of the feebleness of their hands. On that day, the approaching day, nope, that doesn't get it to me. I have a seven verse... Yeah, uh, go to chapter 49. This is it. We're going to talk about Ammon. You know where Ammon is. That's one of the two, two children of, of Lot and his daughters. Ammon today is the capital city of Jordan, Ammon, Jordan. So this is these first six verses are important. Now concerning the children of Ammon, thus said Hashem, does Israel have no children? Does he have no heir? Why then is Malcolm, and if you look over, you can find out that Malcolm was a uh, deity that the Ammonites had, inherited Gad. Now remember when Israel came into the land with Joshua, Remember, there were tribes that did not want to go across the Jordan, but wanted to stay on the eastern side because of their cattle and all of the sheep that they had. Gad was one of those two tribes. Gad occupied that area around Ammon. So, again, inherited Gad, his people dwelling in its cities. And therefore, behold, days are coming. They hadn't arrived yet. And the word of Hashem, when I will... Make an alarm of war heard in Rabbah, which is also a city in Jordan, the capital of the children of Ammon, and it will become a heap of ruins, and its surrounding towns will be burned down uh, in fire. Then Israel will inherit its inheritors, said Hashem. Well, o Heshbon, which is again down along the Dead Sea area, for Ai has been plundered. Cry out, O you daughters of Rabbah, gird yourselves with sackcloth, lament and wander about in the sheepfolds. For Malcolm will go into exile, his priests and his officers together. Why do you pride yourselves in the, on the valleys? Your valley flows with blood, O wayward daughter, who trusts in, the, in her treasures, saying, 
who could ever attack me? Behold, I am bringing a fright upon you from your entire surroundings. So whatever is going on around them, their entire surroundings, remember Amman is in the middle of a Palestinian multitude. And the word of the Lord, Hashem, Elohim, master of legions, you will scatter everyone in his own direction. And there will be no one to bring together those who are wandering about. But afterwards, I will return the captivity of the children of Ammon, says the word of Hashem. There's a cataclysmic war that's going to happen around the city of Ammon. Right now, everybody says that King Hussein has done a wonderful job and there is no problem there. There is a terrible problem there. The Heshemites are outnumbered five to one. Not only that, they're being pushed by the Palestinians who live there. Either they will revolt or you will go to war with Israel for our brethren, the, those living in Gaza. That's what's coming. Now, I want you to take those same six verses, and I want to read from the bottom to the top. We're going to read it backwards, okay? Takes a little bit of thinking. Where are you at? I'm so sorry. I, I, we're in Jeremiah chapter 49. We're going to be in verse number six first. I'm going to read backwards verse by verse, okay? This is one of those things that works on your brain. You, We tend to make our brain a pattern-seeking device. Well, I'm going to change the pattern. It's going to go up instead of down. It says, but afterwards, I will return the captivity of the children of Ammon. Why is he going to return it afterwards? Behold, I am bringing a fright upon you from your entire surroundings. And the word of my of my Lord, Hashem Elohim, master of legions, you will be scattered, or you will scatter everyone in his own direction. In other words, everyone will be for himself. The nation will be at odds with each other. The Heshemites, and again, a Heshemite is a Bedouin, is a, a tribe of Bedouins. So this is what's going on. And there will be no one to bring together those who are wandering about. Why not? Look at verse number four. Why do you pride yourselves on the valleys? Your valley flows with blood, O wayward daughter, who trusts in her treasures, saying, who could ever attack me? They will be attacked from within. Verse number three. Wail, O Heshbon, which is right there by the Dead Sea. For Ai has been plundered. You know what happened in Ai. That's where Israel plundered. That was the second city that they captured after Jericho. Remember that? So there's going to be a problem between Israel and Heshbon. Cry out, you daughters of Rabbah. Rabbah is north of that, towards the uh, area that was occupied by uh, oh, not, not Od. Uh, what's the other big one? Uh, with a anyway, see home. Thank you very much. See home. So cry out, you daughters of Rabbah, gird yourselves with sackcloth, lament and wander about in the sheepfolds. For Malcolm will will go into go out into exile, his priests and his officers together. So the military will be scattered also. Two. If you're going to the second verse, therefore, behold, the days are coming. The word of Hashem, when I will make the alarm of war heard in Rabbah, in Jordan, the capital of the children of, of Ammon, and it will become a heap of ruin and its surrounding towns will be burned down to the in, the, in fire. Then Israel will inherit its inheritors, said Hashem. Thus said Hashem. Verse 1, does Israel have no children? There is a war com coming, and it may be triggered by what's going on today. The Palestinians in Jordan are not happy with what's going on in Gaza. We already know that there's, within Israel itself right now, 
there's also an uprising going on. Israel has sent troops into their own cities, into their own camps of Palestinians. And so the war is spreading. It is not getting less. We are focused on one area, Gaza. But if you're really looking at biblical history, you need to look at all of the surrounding cities, all of those, because they are all going to be involved in what's going on. After this is done, I believe what you're going to see next is Gog 3. That will be the third section. That's Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. We will take care of the Ishmaelite kind of people, and then soon we will be taking care of those which are the Edomites. And also what's left of the Ishmael's community. So we'll get to that later, but I just wanted to give you an idea. I want you to, this is energy flowing. It's a river flowing. Understand that there is a lot of, of pieces moving that we are not looking at, that we really need to, to begin to be aware of what's happening across that Middle Eastern area. Britain and France did us no favors when they divided up the countries the way they did. It has made nothing more than constant trouble within those nations. That's why Iraq has, has come and gone twice versus Babylon, and now is Iraq with Saddam Hussein. Now they're just a puppet for Iran. Persia has come and gone, and now Persia is back again. All of these things are, are coming and going, and the energy is coming and going quite quickly. So watch the flow of the water. Watch what's happening. But also understand, water is cleansing. Without water, there's no way to clean oneself. This whole process is about God cleaning. Malcolm and those gods like him will soon be no more because God will bring everything to a head. And that's kind of where we're going. When I finish with Daniel, we're not done. I want to give you Ezekiel. I want to give you Zechariah. I want to give you the, the you probably already understand that the two messiahs, who they are, what they're about. We'll be talking about them. There's a lot of things that we can really learn, or I think we should learn, in preparation for what's coming. If you stay with Rod's classes on Thursdays, you're getting the Torah. I, I can't teach both. So I'm teaching the prophetic end and letting, letting Rod teach the other end. But hopefully there's enough here to pique your interest and to keep you thinking what the world is going through at this point in time and where you're at in the world. It's always important to pray every night for your salvation because you never know when God's going to come and take us. So I, I leave you with that. Anybody have any thoughts that now that I have corrupted your minds, go ahead, Sharon, think out loud. I feel like I talk too much, but you know, um, you keep hearing that Esau or Edom is you know that America, that Rome, America. So what does that mean for us? I mean, only Hashem knows what it means for us. But what does it mean for us? Well, you, you can go to Obadiah. It's a one chapter book, and he talks about Edom. But understand that Edom and Ishmael will both come to an understanding under Yeshua, or under not. Yeshua, they'll, they'll get salvation. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. They will gain salvation. How will they do it? It'll probably come through this whole process. I think President Trump started us as Edomites on the right trail. He focused us on Israel. And he focused us on being their partner as opposed to being their opponent. We've gone three years in the opposite direction. Now, where are we going to go? Whether the nation goes after the Palestinians or not, it's not really going to be our question. Our question is, where will we put our trust? That's kind of what I'm seeing going on. So I, I'm not a Bible expert, but yet at the same point in time, I think good Lord is giving me enough sense and enough common sense to be able to go through the scriptures with help 
because I couldn't create all this by myself. I've talked with Ross. I talked with Rod. There's another fellow that's very important to me. His name is Chuck Dobbs. He's the first one who got me started into the Book of Jubilees. I will be forever grateful for that because I've learned so, so very much from that, from the videos that I'm watching on the different periods and eras of time. They're just, just nuggets in there that I, I, I got to go and, and hang my hat on. But anyway, those are the things that are going for me at this particular point in time. And so I hope I can give you some of the same things. Sharon, you're going to ask another question. I know if anybody else wants to ask them, I'll shut up and you guys, but I know according to judge or to Josh, to according to the book of Joshua, that Gad, uh, Reuben and half of Manasseh all when Babylon took, they, they went into Babylonian captivity a hundred years before Babylon actually attacked Israel. And that was when the Jubilee stopped. That's what they said. That's what it says in the Rashi, you know, what Rashi says that the Jubilee stopped and, and, and it was because until all 12 tribes are brought back into the land, they couldn't be restarted. But that is that is, I'm sorry to interrupt. But you're that is a Gad, Jewish understanding. But you're My, mentioning Gad, you're mentioning Transjordan, Gad, Amon, all that. So uh, that could that be the what will bring back Jubilee? I mean, I'm not saying I don't know. We don't even know who the tribes are anymore or where, you know, who's in what tribe. But no. oh, what, that was just a thought. Well, let me let me add to your thought then, because this is this is going to be very important as we're as we're thinking about this whole subject of what's going on. You have to understand when Rashi and the rest of them were writing their writings. What century was it? Wasn't the twentieth century? wasn't the 19th century, wasn't the 18th century, wasn't the 17th century, it was the 16th century. Four centuries have come and gone. Could they have understood what we know now, having seen the history all the way back? You see, that's the interesting thing. We can see history from today back. We can't see history that we haven't right, reached yet. We depend on the scriptures to help us navigate some of that. I find it fascinating because when I read the book of Jubilees and when I read the book of Enoch, again, these are scrolls that were written by the Essenes. The Essenes were, were I think, and what many others think, some Christians say they were the early Christians. That's not what they were. They were they were the house of Aaron. They moved away from what was going on here because they said what was here was corrupt. And they went back and took the original calendar that God was using. And that calendar that they were using was the Jubilee calendar. As you're looking at the book of Jubilees, you, you, you can tell as you're reading through it, they put down dates. They tell you when these things happened. And they were keeping track all the way back to Adam. That's how far back they were keeping track. When we see that, let me add a sentence. Who is the son of man? Or who is the son of Adam, actually? That's what the phrase should have said. Who is the son of Adam? Well, the son of Adam was Cain and Abel. But Abel died and Cain was sent into to obscurity. So who was the son of Adam? Seth. If you take from the days of Seth to Noah, you have 50 jubilees. If you go from Noah to the exit of Egypt, you have 50 jubilees. Interesting time. Noah's Ark 
is really a key to understanding some of what's in the Bible, as it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah. Now, let me let me ask the question. In, Jer in Genesis chapter 6, and you can look back if you want, but Genesis chapter 6, it begins by saying in, uh, what is it, the... Uh, where, where's the verse with 120? It's early on. I shall not always dwell with man, but for 120 years. What did he mean by 120 years? If you did the math, you will find out from Noah to the exile or to the coming out, is 50 generations. From that, October 7, 2023, are 70 generations. 70 and 20, or 70 and 50, are 120. Aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. He was talking about how long before the appointed time arrives. He was talking not in regular years. He was talking in jubilees. An entirely different way. If you just begin to look at years in terms of jubilees, you find out you have a whole new Bible. Because there's a lot of events that are very, very interesting. Things begin to change in your mind as you're going through it. You begin to know what's happening. Idea. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. I hope you don't mind me doing this. Ezekiel chapter 1. First verse. Okay. Hope you're with me. It happened in the 30th year in the fourth month, on the fifth of the month, as I was among the exiles by the river Havar. Havar is a word meaning already. I'm already here. And the heavens opened up, and I saw visions of God. Now on the fifth of the month, which is the fifth year of the exile of Jehoiakim, so now I now know when Jehoiakim went into exile. I gave it to you in our in our chart. They went into exile in the fourth, uh, 604. So this is 605. 605 would be the first year of the next cycle. Actually, it could also be considered the 30th year of the previous cycle, depending on whether you're using Noah or whether you're using Israel entering into the land. The Bible is filled with all of these clues, textual clues that I haven't I haven't watched, but I need to. I need to go back and understand when these things happen. Because those things that are spoken of there are keys to other things that happen later on. Ezekiel didn't go into captivity with Daniel. He went in the next group. He was in the second group. He and Mordecai went out at the same time. And they both ended up in the middle of nowhere along the river. As we look at, at, at text then, I want you to understand, you're looking at history. When he says he's by the river Havar, there is no river Havar. There was none. It might have been a wadi, a dried riverbed. It might have been a canal, but there was no river. But he's telling us, go through time, follow time. This will help you understand where you're going. So as we're studying the scriptures, I used to take my kids on a, on a, on a walk in history. I used to teach elementary. And so we were doing a, a study, a book study, and it was covering a, a, a large area of time. And so I had the kids make up. Amber alert. We have an amber alert. We have a um, large period of time. 
So I had to make little cards. Each one made their own set of cards. And we went down our hallway and we put the cards up in the hallway. And we walked through time. You understand what I'm saying? This happened here, this happened here, this happened. And eventually they understood the context of what was going on around them in the story. Then I had them walk back through time, starting at this point and moving back through time. Again, getting another perspective of what, what we had just witnessed. We had gone through time, now we're coming back through time. And I had them walk backwards so that they could get the sense of moving back in time. It, it, was, uh, it was one of the freakiest, dumbest, luckiest lessons I ever taught because they, they really understood for the first time what time was. And at the same point in time, they could put it into, into something else. And so when we began to talk in reading class about, about different events and different situations, well, what time was it when it happened? In other words, they became involved in time. They became involved in understanding when things happen. Because as they happen, they could, it, they could get an understanding. I screamed, but I didn't scream. I was very verbal with my daughter. She was high school student, sophomore class, had to do a, a paper on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Well, I said, don't you remember it? I was a sophomore in high school when it happened. I'm asking her, do you remember when it happened? She was never alive for it. She was lucky she knew who John F. Kennedy was. But as we we're going through this whole idea, you know, perspective is important. I've walked through 75 years of history. I've seen things that she hasn't possibly seen. And you folks all have the same, same thing. You've gone through time. And sometimes we have to turn around and look back and see what we've seen. And that's what the Bible is asking us to do. Look back through time. So anyway, I kept you late. I hope you had a good time. I rambled for an hour and 10 minutes, hour and 15 minutes, but Ross, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, if Sharon stops asking questions, a lot of us won't learn anything. <laughs> it's your fault, Sharon. Amen, brother. And I like the questions. Okay. Well, I hope other people like your questions because I didn't hear many of them. It's how I learn. When I understood from Vindel, he was kind of like a teacher. He said, you need three things in order to learn the Torah. And I said, well, what? He says, you need a Torah, you need a teacher, and you need a student. That's the only way it works. But eventually, the student becomes the teacher. The student learn something the teacher didn't know or the teacher passes on and the teacher now is the student and the student is now the teacher and they find a student and they continue the process that's kind of what i'm hoping happens here it's a process you know i can't i'm 75 how many years am i going to have left i don't know but whatever number i will continue to teach but hopefully you people will begin to become teachers. Not to me, but to others around you. That's why that's the way Torah is supposed to work. It's supposed to be for everybody. Tonight I was with a bunch of guys and they were talking about frequencies of energy. I was lost. They <laughs> talked about stuff I had no clue on. I had <laughs> never been there. I intend to read now and try to figure out where they've been from coming from, but you know, at my point in time, I didn't know what they were talking about. But again, that's why they're the teachers and I'm the student. That's what happens. You you learn from others, right? Well, happy Hanukkah. I hope you have a blessed evening. And may you get up in the morning to be with Rod. I think I'll try. So, Sharon? Can I ask one more stupid question? Can't, and you might have a printout, so you could always just send it to me instead of explain it to me for the next hour. 
Okay. <laughs> it is a week of years. I mean, I don't understand. I kept thinking 50 years, but it's like more than that. So I don't understand that. I can't wrap my mind around it. So talk to me like a five-year-old. No, <laughs> just... It's Leviticus no, chapter... Just send me whatever. Okay. It's Leviticus chapter 25. It's only a few verses, but it's it's how one Not interprets again. those verses that's important because even today there's some discussion as to the difference between the Essenes and the Orthodox Jews of today, how they interpret this verse. But if you start in verse number eight, it says, you shall count for yourselves seven cycles of sabbatical years. And what is seven that? Uh, 25. No, I mean, what is that? What are sabbatical years? A sabbatical, well, okay. Take, take, for, take for example, a week. How many days in a week do you work? Six. So what's the, what's the seventh one called? The Sabbath. <laughs> or sabbatical. Or sabbatical. It's, okay, it's, so it's the idea that the seventh day is a non- work day is what it amounts to uh, again as you're going through then so there are seven cycles of sabbatical years so there's six years you work one year you don't six years you work one year you don't and you go through seven cycles of that that's okay? the shemitah the yeah. shemitah right so now you've gone 49 years okay seven times seven you shall sound you shall sound a broken blast on the shofar in the seventh month of the on the tenth of the month. What's the seventh month in uh, the Jewish calendar? Uh, uh, shof, I mean not shofar, Elul or Tishri. Tish, okay. Tishri, okay. So Tishri one is Rosh Hashanah. What is Tishri ten? Tishri 10 is Yom Kippur. So on Yom Kippur, you break, you blow a broken blast. That's the energy that you create on that day. I learned that from David and Ross. I learned about energy. Anyway, back to the story. So on the day of atonement shall sound the shofar throughout your land. You shall sanctify the 50th year and proclaim freedom throughout the land. This is where we have the difference between the Julie, the Jubilees book and many of the Orthodox. It boils down to this. There's no way, or I shouldn't say there's no way, but the understanding is, is that the there is no 50th year. Why is there no 50th year? If you were doing the counting of the Omer, how many days do you count? 49. Wait a second, you missed 50. Why are you only counting 49? Because the 50th day is a special day altogether. It's a separate, it's an it's an end point. The same thing is holding true here. Nissan is when you start this, and you do not plant anything between Nissan and Yom Kippur. <clears throat> At that point in time, you begin what they call the 50th year. 49 and 50 are together, or 50 and one are together, however you want to look at it. But that's the, that's the difference. So now you have this 50th year, if I'm understanding the Jubilees correctly, and I'm understanding what uh, I was been, have been reading. The understanding is that there is no, the, the 49th, 50th, or 50 and one are combined together meaning that at that point in time, those two years become one year. So when I go back to my calendar and I begin to count my days and how many years and all of those other things, I'm really counting only 49 years. Part of the year is actually the 50th year that you're going into. And so that's the process that they, that they go through. So it's the Jubilee is a combination or accounting where 49 to 50, or 50 and 51 are counted together. So in other words, for that whole cycle, you just don't plant. But again, when the cycle ends on Yom Kippur, 
you can begin to plant then so that the food supply will be ready again by Nissan the following year. Go ahead, Ross. You got a better idea? No, just to perhaps maybe a different way of making the statement. The seventh Shemitah is a jubilee. Would that be fair? The seventh, the, the seventh, four, okay. When you hit number 49, that is also a 50th year, the year of Jubilee. So which Shemitah did we just get done with like a year ago? I think it was a year, maybe it was the second, two years ago. Or what no, the number cycle. was that? Dave wants to add his. Dave, why don't you add yours? Maybe you can make that make clearer. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at it at a physical level. So we're looking at 49 years. It's like 49 steps on a ladder, and then you go, to, then you're on you're 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 on the next floor type of a thought. But from a spiritual point of view, there's a process in the background that's going up that's going on seven times seven and then you reach a plateau seven times seven you reach another plateau and then so what's happening is there is a spiritual rising of ourselves and what does that mean it means we we rise up to a newer conscious level there's an obscure verse in uh the new testament i'm going to bring up where it it mentions that the 50th year is the year of abraham i don't know if you all remember that but it is in there and i remember the first time i saw that because what it's talking about is abraham was 50 years old when he started to to pursue the creator pursue god and that's when he left his name, I know they say 75 years, but when he's 50 years old, that's when he started questioning who is God versus these idols that his father was making. So every every 50 years is like it's like we're shedding new skin, like we're raising to a new level of 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 of, of, of spiritual consciousness, and um, that's that's the spiritual side of the physical events. I just want to mention. So I don't know if that helps, but I hope it helps all Definitely of you. Ross, and you just brought a nice spiritual element into it, David. <clears throat> and thank you, Steve, for the the scriptures. I got it. <laughs> well, it gives you something to think about or a nightmare to have tonight, whatever you want to do with it. So anyway, you know, love y'all. It's time for you to go. So, Shalom, Lila Tov. Have a great night. Shalom, and y'all have a good one too. Bye-bye.